On this episode of Marketing Mavericks, we talk about promoting your art on Pinterest and Google Plus and why giving it away for free pays off with Creative Commons. Coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth from Marketing Mavericks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Marketing Mavericks, episode 29, recorded Thursday, October 30th, 2014. Trey Ratcliffe. Welcome to Marketing Mavericks. Today, I am your host, of course, Tanya Hall. We're going to talk all about the intersection of marketing and technology, specifically in the way of being a creative on the internet, and more specifically, being a photographer on the internet. How do you actually go from a guy with a camera to actually being one of the most famous photographers, not just uh, on the internet, but certainly in the world with all kinds of fans and followers all over social media. He's a public speaker. He teaches classes on photography. And uh, we're super happy to have him here joining us today. And that is Trey Ratcliffe. Welcome to Twit. Although you've actually had a show here on Twit before. So it's not exactly, you know, um, new for you, right? Yeah, I love you guys over there, Twit. You guys are awesome. Um, I just got back from a month in Africa, so I got a little bit of Africa burn left on me. Africa um, burn? What does that mean? Yes, but I, I don't know. It was just, it was a wild, it was a wild month over there. But um, I'm super happy to be back and uh, happy to be with you today. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been a fan of yours for a long time, long before I came to Twit, and didn't even know you had a show here at, at one point. Um, but I, 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 you know, I want to take a step back too. So we've we've told everybody why you're here. But let's talk a bit of where you got started. I mean, you, uh, you've you done a lot of things in the past, including you were a, a programmer, right? Um, you actually wrote code. Is that right? I didn't write elegant code. <laughs> I will tell you that with ontological certainty. I was, uh, I, my background is computer science and math. That's what I majored in in college. And my first job coming out of school was was for Anderson Consulting. And we did different technology implementations all around the world. And I did program. Um, and I was never very good at it. And it was kind of one of those things where, you know, when you're in a room with a bunch of programmers and you're, they're really, really good and you're kind of struggling, you think, well, maybe I wasn't meant for this, you know, but you can, you can get by with it, but there's something kind of throbbing in the back of your head, like, mm, maybe this isn't the, the life I was meant for. You also were a gamer at one point. Um, you um, have been uh, actually kind of a famous gamer. So gaming was a part of your life. So you were very much on the, the building end. You were on the gaming end long before you became a photographer. How important was your background in, you know, being, working with computers, uh, being a gamer? I mean, did any of that come into play or was that a vertical for your photography? Yeah. So, well, I'm still a gamer. I'm still a hardcore <laughs> gamer. I always have, ever since I got my Atari 2600 when I was, you know, seven years old, 1977 or 78 or whatever. Um, but yeah, now now I guess I can look back, I can connect the dots of all these various things I did in my life and how they ended up um, forming some kind of synthesis uh, into my current photography. Um, you know, not just working with computers and programming, um, uh, doing these various things, uh, but playing games. I've, I started a few different companies, uh, most of which were, you know, absolute failures. <laughs> but... Um, and you know, I think it's kind of the whole time kind of in the back of my head, there was this throbbing that I was meant to do more in life that I was meant to do something. Um, and so really I was kind of like stumbling through life, I think as people do. And, um, then when I got to be about 35 years old, that's when I got my first real DSLR. And, um, and then I was able to take all these disparate things and put them together into photography. So now it makes sense that everything I was doing, when I thought I was just stumbling, I was actually preparing uh, for some kind of greatness that I didn't even know was coming. And so this is something that I say to other people too, that I know people sometimes feel like they're flailing around or they haven't found their, their groove or their stride yet. I think what's happening is, you know, the, the universe is kind of putting, putting together your future for you. It just kind of faith in the universe that things are going to work out just fine. 
You know, Andrew Weir um, was a guest um, on, on uh, several of our shows, and I interviewed him about um, being a writer and, and being an author and, and marketing your, your book and what that means. And your story sounds a little bit in some ways in the beginning like his. He was a programmer. He, he wrote, you know, he was an engineer, and he really wanted, he had this passion for writing. He wanted to pursue it. His mom was a really big supporter, still is, of his. And he wrote the book, The Martian, and is on his second book right now. And he he talks about this transition for him. What was the the part where you said, okay, I'm actually going to take the leap. I'm not going to... I'm not going to do my steady day job. I'm going to be a photographer full time. And and I think what this would apply to a lot of creative people to take that step into saying, okay, I, I want to monetize this. I want to figure out a way to pursue my passion and make money. When was the, the step that you took to actually make that change? Um, by the way, I love that book, The Martian. It's fantastic. <laughs> Um, it is I'm pretty. jealous that you know Andy. Yeah, that guy's cool. Leo um, is a super huge fan, so he's been on yeah. Triangulation. You'll have to check that out. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable book. So, uh, when did I make the transition? Well, so I when I was um, you know about 35 this time when I got my camera, I was traveling around a lot for work. I had started a um, a game company, and. Uh, we had a we had a pretty good game going, and we had studios kind of all around the world. So I would go visit the, the different studios, and while I was there, um, you know, I'd kind of do the work work part. Um, but they were so beautiful and so interesting. I thought, you know, mm, I feel like I should be taking photos of these places because they were just like really impactful for me, like seeing different cultures, different kinds of people, these little parallel universes all around the world. I thought it was so wonderful, and so I started taking photos. And I started the blog almost immediately, uh, stuckincustoms.com. And also immediately I got into HDR, you know, high dynamic range. Now everyone knows what it is. Back then it was like super edgy. In fact, the only algorithms you can get, you had to, I found them kind of by accident, like uh, MIT and Stanford, they would use these HDR algorithms for like uh, meteorological photos or satellite photos or whatever. And the very first photo I took was so bad and so lame. It didn't look anything like it felt like. I thought, why not? So that's why I went out and started exploring some of these with these HDR algorithms, putting them into my photos. And then I would share them immediately on my blog. And I wouldn't just share the photo, but I would talk about how I made it. Um, you know, the story behind it and the technology behind it. So I started this, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this HDR tutorial um, right there on the blog. And it's just by word of mouth, it just started getting more and more and more popular. Um, we started selling a few things on the website. It's always, it's still the same way it was. 99% free, 1% of stuff we sell. But it started making some money, which was a surprise to me, um, kind of while I was at this other job. Now that was, that was winding down. Um, uh, but even like without even really trying, the blog was starting to make some money. I could see that I was really onto something. And that, um, and I loved it. You know, I, you know, I was doing it. Uh, before anyone was paying attention, but I really loved uh, taking the photos and and kind of sharing how I did it. It was just it just made natural sense to me. Um, so then I thought, well, you know, what if I focus 100% of my time on this? Uh, what could it be? So I, you know, I just went for it, and uh, I couldn't I couldn't be happier. I I can't believe it worked out. I can't believe it's still working. I mean, I don't take any for granted. It's it's just it's mind blowing. Um, yeah, I'm super grateful. Um, I pinch myself every day. Um, I don't really think I uh, deserve um, any of it. Uh, but still, as always, it's always the photography comes first, the art comes first, sort of the purity. And when I'm just alone creating um, photos or on my computer post processing or whatever, that's always the core of it. And I think as long as that's the core and that's pure and that makes me happy, I think everything else will just flow naturally from that. You know, I should mention uh, that your your blog that we keep talking about is stuckincustoms.com. And you've kept the same blog. What? Well, why Stuck in Customs, although it's quite clever? What, what made you decide Stuck in Customs? Well, it, the, the name has two meanings. The second one is too clever for its own good. No one ever gets it. I'll explain it here. The, the first one is, it just is sort of a fun name. You know, when you travel and you go through customs, sometimes you get stuck in customs. So it's sort of a, a fun name, I guess. Um, and then the other reason is that, you know, when you, uh, when you travel and you're inside of another culture and you're sort of experiencing, um, their customs, you realize that you're stuck in your own. 
Ooh, that was very deep. Try it's very <laughs> deep, but it's a little too. It's a little too much. I, I, didn't, I don't mean for it to be that clever, but yeah, there's a little element of that too. I suppose. <laughs> you know, yeah. but you are actually a deep kind of guy. You mentioned before the show started that you cry at just about anything. We should show like little cute kitten pictures or something to see if we can work up a tear. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think uh, it's. I'm. I'm very sensitive, and. Um, do you think, think that comes out in your photography? I mean, do you think a part of who you are is also a reflection of um, the pictures you take or vice versa? Well, I'm sure of it. And I think that kind of the more open and vulnerable you are um, as an artist, the more it shows in your work and the more accessible it is. And, you know, of course I get, you know, I get sad and happy. But I think, you know, this idea that you can just either be like um, average or, and happy, but never be sad is ridiculous. So I think like, if you see some like really happy people, chances are they're also very, very sad sometimes. There's just sort of this natural cycle. And I think you, it's okay to feel all this stuff deeply. And then also to step back from your mind and know that you are more than all these little thoughts in your mind. You're, you're the soft space on the outside of it all. And then when you can kind of bring all this stuff into some kind of synthesis, um, some kind of harmony, um, you can sort of channel the universe at times and occasionally make some some interesting art. I really don't feel like it's me doing it. It's something else. Um, and I just happen to uh, channel it from time but from time to time. but I, I do find that the more um, open and, and vulnerable and and um, and this sort of thing that I am, the, the more the art flows naturally. And I think you know I the the photography that moves me the most is, when you see emotion in the, the image, whether it's, you know, a beautiful scenery of maybe, you know, lots of hot air balloons or something, but you also see a child who's looking and excited and you can almost imagine what they're thinking. And you be able to, being able to capture that is is something that I think you puts the difference between like guy or girl with camera to somebody who actually is an artist. And um, and photography is an art that I think a lot of us really appreciate and want in our home. I actually have a lot of photography myself. Not quite the Trey Ratcliffe yet, but um, I aspire to be. <laughs> which, speaking of yeah. which. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, you, you teach a lot of classes. So you, you have your blog. You've actually, um, you teach classes and you help educate people on this. Specifically, I think I want to talk about the HDR photos, which I think is, is something you're, you know, you mentioned earlier you're good at and is a really popular thing now for people who are interested in photography. Do you, um, how, how does teaching photography online help grow your business? Is that a, um, a different vertical for you? I mean, does that really push people to buy your images? I mean, how does that work? Do, is, it, is it, is it useful for your time to actually, you know, teach people on how to be a photographer? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, yes, it's useful. Um, I have my HDR tutorial uh, online, which is free. It's like a text tutorial. But then we also have a, a video one um, that we sell for like about $100. It's, you know, three or four hours. And you get to see me out shooting in the field. Um, you get to see me on my computer, everything that I click and all my tools and this sort of thing. Um, you get to see the whole shoot and match. Um, now, one reason we made that is because it scales really well. Um, in that it's impossible for me to go actually sit down with hundreds of thousands of people and, and teach them this kind of stuff. So, uh, so the video works really well in that regard. Um, and I do like to teach. Um, I've, um, I think I have a weird teaching style in a way. I'm a little bit like, you remember Bob Ross in um, his painting show that was on PBS, the guy with the big afro? Yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah, sort of this stream of consciousness, uh, very arty kind of situation. I do talk about all the tech and that kind of stuff, but the key is to kind of get the tech out of the way so that you can kind of float above it and create stuff. Um, so this is, um, it is sort of a very personal, um, artistic way of teaching, and it seems to resonate with um, a lot of people, which is, uh, again, surprising. Um, but... Um, yeah, so that's that's one thing that has really seemed to help um, uh, by sh telling people how you do everything and kind of sharing with them and getting them on board. Um, you know, there's there's not a finite pie of creativity in the world. We're actually all kind of growing the pie together. And it all kind of goes under a, a, a bigger mission. And this might sound a little 
new agey or whatever. So I apologize. Um, but you know, like I think, like, why do I do all this stuff? What's what's the purpose? Um, and you know, why do I share uh, what's going on? And then we've also started this other thing called the Arcanum, which we can talk about in a little while. But like, why am I doing that? Well, I I actually think that there's sort of like these stepping stones of of consciousness, if you will. Okay. Step one, the first step is just when somebody sees a pretty photo online, you know, on Google or Facebook or whatever, they they look at the photo and for a moment, you know, the world kind of stands still and they can just enjoy the photo. Okay. There's just like, there's, there's no past, there's no future. There's just there with a the photo and it's like a little bit meditative, isn't it? When you look at a nice photo. So that's step one. Uh, step two is they, they think like, oh, maybe, maybe I'll take some photos too. Right. And so they, they start taking photos, even with their mobile phone, it doesn't matter. And at, at that point, you know, when, when you're actually taking a photo, um, time kind of stands still, you know, when you're trying to compose a shot or do something beautiful, you're, you're not thinking about the past or the future. You're just very present right there with your camera. And then you might bring it onto your computer or leave it on your phone and start processing. And again, this process is just, you're, you're quite conscious during this, this period and it's super meditated. Now, it's hard to teach, you know, billions of people around the earth to, to meditate. But I think that photography is sort of like a sideways way into meditation. And I think that the more people that we get interested in photography, kind of the more you bring, um, you know, millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people into sort of a, a conscious state, which I think is ultimately really good for, for the world. So your website where you post your pictures as well as your new Facebook page, which we'll point to at the end of towards the end of the show and some of your other sites, you're on Pinterest, you're, you know, I, I was like, couldn't believe how many followers you have on Pinterest. I love Pinterest. Don't judge me. <laughs> I, love Pinterest. I love Pinterest too. It's great. I actually, I looked at the followers on there and I, I guess it's around 5 million or something. And yeah. It's crazy. So it's, uh, it's, I've analyzed, it's like 95% women on Pinterest. I have never been so popular with women, I assure you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but it's, Pinterest is great. I really get in touch with my feminine side over there. I can, I can put up the stuff that not all the guys will understand. Well, it's, it's a great place to put your photography or any sort of artist to, to display their work. But, you know, you didn't just become famous because you were on Pinterest. It's your work that people find, right? So how do they do that? I mean, do you actually drive people to, um, to, your, to your website? How many people go to your website a, like a day or a month? And what kind of, what kind of fans do you have actually to, to your blog? Um, well, we have... Um millions of people that come to the website. Um, it does all funnel from uh, either organically through Google. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I think I picked up a bug. Uh, a little light Ebola I picked up over there. Um, <laughs> Don't and, say that. You did just get back yeah. from Africa. Yeah, just, it's a mild case. It's a mild case. Yeah, okay. Just um, in touch. Yeah. And so what we do um, on, on Google, uh, Facebook, all these, we, we basically toss the traffic back and forth between Google and Facebook and to the blog and from the blog to Pinterest and Twitter. I mean, it's just like, it's like, it's wild. It's like a German swingers party. Every, just <laughs> everything is happening everywhere. And so um, the traffic, it just kind of builds up onto itself because people are busy. And um, very few people follow me on each of these places. There's like kind of the Venn diagrams all over the place. So we, we just, I do different things every place. Like I do different stuff on my Facebook page. I do a Google, I do special stuff on the blog. I do different stuff on Twitter and Pinterest. So new stuff is always happening everywhere. And it's always me that does it. I don't farm it out to some PR company because um, I really like doing it. It's kind of fun. I get, I get into it. So you, you, you do have a team of people though that work for you. How many, how many employees do you have now? Um, we have a team of about a dozen people that are uh, full-time and part-time. And they, um, Curtis Simmons is sort of my right-hand man, my chief operating officer. He really runs the business, which is great. So I can just be artistic and irresponsible. Um, we have uh, a guy named Luke Lakatosh who kind of runs our entire support team. He also runs our, uh, we have an eBooks website called flatbooks.com. He runs that. Um, but we have, uh, you know, programmers and uh, web guys and, um, people that make and uh, maintain our apps for us, um, graphic designers. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, it's just like a regular company. 
uh, just kind of the tip of the iceberg is what you see is just kind of the photos. But every, it's all always around like making making beautiful photos and helping to um, inspire people. Last I checked, you had, I think, around 10 million uh, followers on um, uh, Google. Is that right? Like somewhere around like David Beckham and Lady Gaga. And then there's Trey. Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, that's awesome. Uh, but, you know, so you have photographers out there thinking, okay, well, I can start a blog. You know, I can do that in my, my part time, you know, you know, in the evenings or weekends. I love photography. Maybe they're, they're taking your classes. Where do you go from having a really successful blog to, you know, you're a public speaker, you've got fans, you've got a staff of 12 people helping you. I mean, what's what's the first thing that you would recommend somebody do to start putting their creative into the, either social media or marketing it through search and Google? I mean, how would you recommend they get started today? Well, this is a good question. I don't I don't know if I always have the best advice because I as far as I can tell, my situation is pretty unique. And so I'm not totally sure it's um, it's uh, like repeatable, but I, I did figure out a few things along the way that seemed to make sense. Um, and I think this is probably good advice no matter what. One is figure out, you know, the, the one or two or three things that you're, you're really good at and you're really passionate about. And, you know, if it happens to be photography, fine, creativity, whatever it is. Um, and then you have to try to figure out a way to maximize. You only have so many cycles in a day, right? You know, you wake up, you, got, you, have, you have things you got to do. You got to get the kids off to school. Um, there's just life, right? But then between that, you only have so many cycles where you are, you can be focused and engaged and actually do something, right? Um, what you want to do is make sure as many of those cycles as possible is used purely on your creative process, on bringing stuff into the world that was not there before, okay? What this means, even if you are good at other important things that your business will need, like for example, like I said, I was not, not a good programmer, but I know enough. I know how to build a blog. I know how to get in there and mess with the CSS. Um, you know, I can play with the JavaScript and, you know, I, I, can, I can make our website so it's responsive on, on uh, mobile devices and, and the web. And so it's, you know, you can, I can do all this stuff. I could also do all the graphic design. Um, I, I might not be the best, but I can do it. I could do everything myself. Every single part of this business, I could do myself. And I was doing it for like about mm, a year. I was doing everything. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. I Every 10 minutes I spend programming the website is 10 minutes that I should be creating. So I jumped on odesk.com. I don't know if you've heard of odesk. It's sort of like um, uh, eBay for brains, I guess. And so you, you jump on there and I said, I need someone to tag my photos on Flickr, okay? Because I would spend about five minutes a day, and this is back when Flickr was the only game in town. And that was kind of how you got noticed or whatever. I thought, okay, well, I got to tag my photos. And I, I did enjoy tagging my photos because I like words and I that kind of stuff. It was kind of a fun game to tag your photos. Like come up with 50 tags for this photo. <laughs> But it, it, it did take five minutes and then I figured, okay, well, that takes me 25 minutes uh, a week or whatever. So I jumped on Odesk and I said, I want someone to tag my photos. Um, and and then what people do is they bid. They say like, I'll tag your photos every week for, you know, $27. And some other guy from Bangladesh says, you know, I'll do it for $23. Uh, so, and then I gave him a test. Uh, we found someone to tag my photos. And that was the first time that I feel, realized, okay, it's much better to pay someone else to do that so that I can focus on the creativity because in, in that 25 minutes, I can create more value um, than it costs me to have them do that. So that was just, that's one example, but I did that more and more and more until eventually I was only creating. That is such an important piece of advice because I think I know a lot of really good artists, photographers or alike, and they don't actually promote their work very well. Their websites aren't that great. And they certainly don't tag photos. I learned accidentally on MySpace a long time ago that tagging photos was, yep, I said MySpace, uh, is actually a really good idea. And, you know, the way that you, you know, search, uh, the way Google works, um, it, it really helps. But there's also this idea of creative commons, right, which you uh, talk a lot about. And I, that makes me think, well, how do you monetize? I mean, you certainly want to create work and you want people to see your work, but how do you make money? Like, you know, you basically kind of 
which we appreciate, give your work away for free by letting everybody see it and share it. Yes, it's it's completely counterintuitive, isn't it? That the more free stuff you give away, the more money you make. Uh, and I've, I've done this since the beginning, um, and I still do. I always will. In that I've got every day, I put up a new photo every single day on the blog. Um, and it's always full res, you know, seven, 8,000 pixels across. Um, I put on no watermarks. I hate watermarks on photos. I think they're super ugly um, and annoying. And and whenever I see a watermark on someone's photo, I kind of like look at the font and I start psychoanalyzing them based on the font they chose. And I just cannot stop looking at that, at the, at the gosh darn uh, watermark. Um, maybe that's just me, but it really bothers me. Anyway, so I have no watermark. Um, and I encourage people to share. Um, Creative Commons non-commercial is my kind of situation, uh, which means people can share them. They can use them as Facebook backgrounds on your phone. Um, people can even make a little personal printout at home. Big, big deal. Um, but some people actually do want the real print and they will come and they'll, they'll find it on my website and they'll order like a real print uh, that's like super high quality and it's maybe part of a numbered series, um, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, I think um, it's actually, it's, I think it's naturally human to create and share. Um, not unlike a child, you know, I have uh, three kids and my middle daughter, my eight-year-old, she'll make a picture and she'll just run around the house. She just kind of wants everyone to see it, to share. Um, just like sharing is sort of the, the natural way. And I think so many photographers or people in general, they let fear, uh, you know, uh, be the basis of so many decisions they make. Um, and maybe you'll just put out a small size or you're afraid people are going to steal it. Or, um, you know, I, th I think having fear-based decision-making, especially as a, as a creative, is, is, uh, just doesn't make any sense to me. You're an incredibly positive person and you have a great outlook and you've talked about, you know, crying at the drop of a hat, which I keep mentioning, but uh, I think that's great. Yeah. I think it shows your, your genuine person but you also have a lot of people that don't like your point of view about Creative Commons. And you've had some haters and some people that were unsupportive and specifically the photography community. And you have an interesting way of approaching that. How do you feel about the people that are unsupportive of you and how successful you are? Probably very jealous, actually. Um, well, <laughs> so I, I, do, I do notice all these uh, comments, right? Um, I have a lot of haters. Um, but I don't really let it affect me. Um, I think it's interesting. I do kind of psychoanalyze a little bit to figure out why they're like that. A lot of it came early on because I, um, cause, well, so I share everything that I do. I help teach people and like, especially a long time ago, photographers is sort of one of these older, um, trades, you know, where you kind of keep the, your secrets close to your chest and you're not supposed to tell people how you do stuff, uh, which I think is patently absurd. Um, and I think, again, it's very natural to, to share um, not just photos, but techniques and everything. Um, I think that's, uh, that's the right way to be, but that does make a lot of people mad. Uh, another group of haters um, uh, say that, uh, uh, you know, my, my violent love of post-processing is like, you know, the, the devil. And um, because a lot of photographers think that, you know, you take a photo in the camera and that that's the photo. And that if you do stuff to it afterwards, this is somehow um, evil. Um, of course, I think that's ridiculous. Um, I love post-processing my photos. It's, I come out here, I come to my studio at night. I, I light candles. I listen to weird music. I open up, you know, Lightroom and Photoshop and Photomedix and all my tools, and I just get lost in here, and you know, until two or three a.m. It's like super meditative. It's super fun, um, and then I look at the end, and sometimes I make something really beautiful. So the process is fun. The ending result is beautiful. I mean, how how can anything so beautiful and fun be evil? I don't know, but all these haters that say such ridiculous, hateful things, it just says it says more about them than it does about me. Um, I don't really care. Um, you know, like you say that I am, you know, a very kind of happy, positive, loving person. Um, but I will tell you one thing is that inside of me, there's a tiny little white burning core of hot hate energy. Okay. It's in there. All right. And whenever these people say these things, 
it just goes and it makes that little white core of hate a little bit hotter, right? But I don't think what they realize is that I kind of just, I take all that and I use it to make myself more awesome. So all they're doing is they're just feeding the awesomeness with their nonsense. Feeding the awesomeness with their <laughs> their awesomeness with their with their hate. I love it. I love yeah. it. I love it. Speaking of burning ball of fire, you actually recommend that new photographers who are interested in um, getting started actually go to Burning Man, which I thought was kind of a surprise. You've been to Burning Man. You've actually got a video of Burning Man on uh, on your website. Uh, why why Burning Man? I mean, seems kind of an interesting uh, suggestion. Yeah, well, Burning Man is awesome. I've been there five times. I think I'll go pretty much every year from now from now on. Um, and I think um, Burning Man is a wonderful place to kind of get to know yourself and to experiment. It's a it's a safe place. It's a creative place. And I think so many uh, photographers just want permission to create and be totally free. And this is a place that you can do that. Um, I mean, what, what a wonderful place to, to just try new things, um, to take pictures of people in different ways. Like, for example, I know everyone that takes photos likes taking photos of people. Absolutely. But I would say, I mean, this is just sort of an estimate based on people that I talk to, 70, 80 percent of photographers are scared to take photos of people or they don't know how to do it or they don't want to seem like they're being creepy or they just don't know how to approach it. Um, so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, humans are like one of the most interesting things to take photos of. Now, I'm, I personally am very comfortable walking on city streets in Tokyo or New York or London or whatever and taking street photography photos. I'm really, I'm super cool with it. But I think one reason I, I got better at it is because of Burning Man. So everyone at Burning Man is just there to be photographed. Um, before I went, I thought everyone there was like some kind of narcissistic, um, you know, egomaniac or, or I didn't know why people were like this. But when I got there, I realized they weren't, they weren't like that. They were just very comfortable with their own sense of self-expression. Everyone is in costume all week. Basically, they have 60,000 interesting looking people that are in costumes that are just happy to be photographed. Um, you might get rejection one out of 100 times, but it's not a mean rejection. It's more like, well, you know, please delete that photo because they might have some other life, like I'm a school teacher and I don't want that photo getting out, letting the other parents see, see that I, I do this in my spare time or whatever. Uh, but I mean, that's one out of 100. Um, and the other 99, it's just a great chance to take photos of people and art and just weird conditions. And you could experiment with the kind of photos you take. I experiment a lot with my post-processing there. Um, yeah, it's just, I think it's just great for any, any creative mind to kind of expand their own while they're there. How important is the equipment that you have? And, you know, actually, cause that's probably one of the biggest questions. I think some of my friends who are photographers get asked is, you know, uh, oh, great, great images, great photography. What kind of camera do you use? Right. I mean, so how important is the, yep. is the equipment? Well, there's this, there's this joke amongst photographers where, um, you know, you, you go over to your aunt's house or, and you have like an amazing dinner. And you think, oh my God, this food is amazing. What kind of oven do you have? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and really the oven doesn't matter, all right? Um, all cameras today are so good. Um, uh, there's a lot, of, there's these forums that are filled with these gearheads that just debate nonsense all day. It's unbelievable how much time and energy photographers spend talking about equipment. I mean, they really ought to be out taking photos, in my opinion. Uh, but it's just, the thing is, photography tends to attract very um, heady, um, intelligent kind of people, very clever kind of people, and very left brain sort of people. And it's a very safe place for left brain people to start talking about gear and to start analyzing f-stops and sensor sizes and all this happy work. Right. Well, um, I'm here to tell you, it doesn't, it does not matter. All these cameras are so good nowadays. You'll be happy uh, with almost anything. Now, having said that, I will tell you my equipment. Um, I did switch recently from Nikon. I had all the big Nikon DSLR systems. I had a D2X, a D3X, a D800, all the lenses, all that stuff. I dumped it all for, uh, for Sony. 
Um, I'm all Sony now. By the way, I'm not sponsored by Sony. I might be in the future, uh, but for right now, this is a this is a very pure thing. Um, I have a, a Sony A7R. That's kind of my main camera. And I see you're showing the website there. I do have recommendations because everyone still asks me like what kind of camera. So I have like good, better, and best. I think that's how the old Montgomery Ward calendar would advertise their washing machines. <laughs> you're dating yourself, Trey. Talking about Montgomery Ward catalog. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it is what it is. That's okay. Um, so yeah, I, I now use an A7R. Um, I love it. That camera completes me. Um, I also have an A7S. I'm working on that review right now. Uh, but I have full reviews on my website. I only review stuff that I actually use. I put up a lot of sample photos. Um, but yeah, the Sony system, this mirrorless system is still full frame. I have a lot of different lenses that are interchangeable. I use Leica lenses also. I have a little Leica adapter. Uh, but yeah, it, Anyway, the camera doesn't matter, but that's what I use. So as far as the pie chart of how you make money, is it, it's, is it, and, and I, I guess I'm asking this question for, again, those creatives who are kind of getting started. It, do you actually sell more images? Um, and that's kind of the revenue stream for you. Is it, you're, you've got a lot of speaking engagements now. You've got, in fact, you just launched um, uh, Arcanium. Is that right? Uh, nine, nine months or so ago? Yeah, the Arcanum, we launched that. And what is that? Yeah. Well, so speaking of, you know, how to make money and this sort of thing, um, I, I noticed that there's a lot of photographers out there that have uh, various websites and this sort of stuff. And, and um, I actually think it's better if we all come together and kind of teach in a new way. And that's kind of what the Arcanum is. And the Arcanum, our little tagline for the Arcanum is that it's a, uh, a magical academy of artistic mastery. And what we've done is we've kind of brought back the master and apprentice system in style. Um, I think that so many websites, including my own, by the way, uh, do a real disservice to people that want to learn photography in that it's, it's a very stale kind of system in which people might log onto a website and they might start watching video to learn how to do something but it's incredibly impersonal and it's very blue sky. You know, you're not sure which video should I watch? What do I do? So I think the best way to learn is in a very personal way and to have a master that's there kind of guiding you along. So the way the Arcanum works is we have masters um, and the, <coughs> excuse me, and the master goes into our database of applicants and they pick 20 apprentices they want to teach. Um, currently, this thing is so popular, we actually have applications from over 110 countries around the world. Everyone is just sitting in there kind of waiting for their master to choose them. But once you're chosen, um, you start out like as a level one photographer, okay? And then you slowly start to level up, level two, level three, level four, all the way up to level 20. That's currently our level cap. We're going to have expansion packs coming very soon. But every level you have different challenges. Your masters are always overseeing you. Sometimes the challenges you do with fellow apprentices, you get critiques. We use Google Hangouts. All the critiques go up into our grand library. We've got like 700 videos up inside of there now. So we are changing the way that photography is taught. It's very personal. It's like a bottom up school instead of a top down school. Um, People love it. People are crying. Um, we're really changing lives. We made a few mistakes. We're kind of in this beta period, but we're really ironing out those mistakes, and it's uh, it's unbelievable. I think it's uh, it's it's really going to change the way that art is taught around the world. You saw several images in the video that we're showing with Google Glass and people wearing. It's a very controversial thing, but you know, as geeks love it. And yeah. um, you you actually talk about how that can actually be a, a do or door opening to some of the most creative and some really interesting photography talking about gear. How do you, what is your point of view on Google Glass? Are you a Google Glasser? Um, yeah, I'm a big, look, I've got my Google shirt on here. I'm a big Google <laughs> fanboy. And Always ready. I'm a Google superhero. I can just take it off and start talking about Google anytime. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I love Google Glass. Um, and, but particularly from a, a teaching and communication standpoint, and this is one of the ideas really behind the Arcanum. Um, I do think that wearable um, stuff is uh, it's coming. It's inevitable. It's all going in that direction, it, whether it takes the form of Google Glass, a new version of Google Glass, Amazon Glass, Apple, everyone will make this kind of stuff, right? 
Um, but then what happens is you actually can connect with people. Like we use them in the Arcanum so that, uh, and eventually people can, an apprentice can like call up their, their master anytime and they can share vision and they can ask for advice. Or maybe the master's out doing a shoot, holding his camera, just talking about it. All his apprentices are tuned in, watching him do this stuff. Um, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how personal it can be, how much you can communicate with it. And I think that like teaching is probably going to be like the killer app for uh, Google Glass. This certainly is an industry that's changed a lot. Photography, you know, old school. I used to take a lot of black and white actual, you know, film photography when I was uh, in college. And I really love photography. It's a passion of mine as well. But it's, there's a lot to do. And a lot has changed. What about augmented reality? Where does that play into photography? Somebody may not realize that that's actually something that you've talked about. Yeah, well, what do you what do you mean? Maybe ask a different way, so I'm sure to answer it. <laughs> well, you the talk way you, want. you talk about augmented reality and in, uh, in teaching and connecting other photographers. I mean, does that help people actually learn to take better pictures? Is it what kind of how does that tie into to what you're teaching? Yeah, I think so. Um, if you can give people any kind of visual aids to help them with their own art, um, it can only help. So I think you can use glass and many different tools to help um, create um, a new way to communicate with one another. And if you, can, if you can take like, let's say for example, I'm out shooting the mountains here, okay? And a lot, a lot of people in landscape situations are like, oh, this is really pretty, but I don't really know how to compose. Like, what should I have in the shot? How wide should I go? How narrow should I go? And if you're sitting there and you have sort of these tools that you can kind of augment your own reality, uh, with them, and you can share this with uh, the other people. You can say, well, this is what it's going to look like zoomed in. This is what it's going to look like if you crop it over here. Look how much better it is if we go wide angle in the situation, if we look at the clouds. Um, as you layer this information onto them, they can just see it immediately, and it goes right into their brain in a convenient way. It's better than, um, it, it, it's, it's one of the best ways, I think, for, um, for you to get an idea across. Well, I am looking forward to checking out more of your work. I love and where you're at. I mean, you're in one of the most beautiful places on the planet, New Zealand. I no, don't need to ask you why you moved there. That's for sure. <laughs> and thanks. Yeah, for, it is pretty here. Thanks for getting up after your party last night um, to uh, yeah. hit in the town to uh, to join us on the show and talk about what you're doing. So, what's next? How can we follow your work? And uh, where should we look for your beautiful images and cry a little bit? Oh, <laughs> well, I guess the best place to always come is, is stuckincustoms.com. Um, we have a, a newsletter on there that I recommend people sign up for. And you just go to Stuck in Customs. There's a sign up over there on the right. Actually, on today's blog, there's a, there's a little sign up for it. And whenever we have new stuff that comes out, um, uh, that's a good place to find out. Every now and then we do um, a, a workshop. We maybe do one like physical workshop here in New Zealand. Um, we, we just did one in Africa. Um, and sometimes the newsletter is the best place to find out because these, these often sell out even before they appear on the blog. Um, so yeah, plus the newsletter is really pretty and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm on all the social media, you know, whatever people. You utilize people it quite find. well, actually. We talked about Pinterest earlier, but you're on Facebook. In fact, you talked before the show, you actually have a new Facebook page. Is your, is your website pushing people to your new page or should we announce your new page? No, you can announce a new page. It's it's facebook.com slash Trey Ratcliffe. Um, yeah, I used to have, I had a personal page. I still do. Um, but I think uh, I wanna, I'm going to try it with a, a real page for a while. Um, uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of the, the spot. There he is. Well, I'm going to go look at your pictures and cry a little bit. Joy, oh. happy, <laughs> happy tears of joy. Um, thanks yeah. for coming on the show, and we'll be following your work. And uh Congratulations on being such a success in a space. I think a lot of people look up to you and admire how you've done it. I think you've given some good advice and we'll be checking out the classes to learn a little bit more. Ah, oh, well, thank you, Tanya. I was, I'm honored to be here with you. Thank you for saying those nice things. And, and thank you everyone up there at the Twit Network behind the scenes. It's, uh, it's good to see you guys. Hey, there's a great team here. Yeah. Well, we'll talk, talk soon, Trey, and uh, get some sleep. Don't get, let that Ebola get you. 
<laughs> I won't. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. That was Trey Radcliffe, one of the most famous photographers. Uh, check him out on Google+. Plus. Go to his website, which is Stuck in Customs, and uh, check out all of his links to everything that he does. I think he's been he's a great example of how to use the internet to promote your art. And uh, that wraps up another episode of Marketing Mavericks. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll talk to you next week.